Folks who are in here already, uh, welcome. We'll get started in about five minutes.
show. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, if you are on video, go ahead and give me a thumbs up if you are hearing me speak right now. Uh, Yomi Mark, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, sounds like we're rolling. Scott, Maggie, Ellie, everything going well. Awesome. Well, we're certainly going to have some folks uh, here rolling in shortly, but we're going to go ahead and get things kicked off and started. Um, first off, thank you so much for joining us uh, and welcome. I uh, think we're sort of blazing some new trails here by having a, a really uh, well-attended Zoom workshop over the internet. I know a lot of us are sitting at home comfortable on our couches, which is awesome. Um, and we're keeping our distance from everyone. That's exactly uh, what we would want. Um, so I'm actually coming to you live from my home. And um, I'm so happy to be able to talk to you today about design systems. Uh, we did break this apart into two different sessions. And uh, we're really excited that you could join for this first one and hope that you join us for session two as well. Um, so just wanted to give you a quick welcome. Uh, thank you again for coming. I hope you're comfortable. I hope you're well caffeinated and I hope you're eager to learn. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in. So just some really quick digital workshop etiquette. Um, I know for a lot of us, this may be the first time we've been in a workshop with um, lots of different people. Uh, first and foremost, if you would, please mute yourself during the presentation. This is a presentation format and um, you know, we'll just make it easier for everyone to, uh, to follow along and hear themselves. Um, for questions, we are gonna have a Q&A at the end. Um, save those questions until the end, write them down on a scratch pad if you have one. Uh, you're welcome to put them in the chat as well. Um, if you'd like, but just know that uh, there will be some time at the end to answer your questions. Number three, video on or off, completely up to you. Um, I will keep mine on for the duration of this, uh, this workshop here, but ultimately, if you decide you don't wanna keep yours on, that's totally fine too. Um, number four, well, you're welcome to take screenshots, share them on social media, put them on Instagram, put them on Twitter, uh, whatever you kids are using today uh, for social media, uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, and then lastly, feel free to use the, the chat uh, during the presentation. I know as people are streaming in, uh, they'll continue to sort of introduce themselves. If you're unfamiliar with Zoom, uh, if you click on the participants panel, you will actually be able to send direct messages to folks if maybe you want to have a side conversation and uh, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Uh, so without further ado, I will jump right in. Um, I will say that Running a workshop like this is a bit like um, sort of directing a symphony orchestra or choreographing a ballet. So I'm gonna do my best uh, to make it through. I do have my colleague, Ellie, um, who's gonna be helping uh, field your questions. If you have any questions at any time or you're having any issues, feel free to reach out to her um, and she will 
um, help answer those questions. Um, she'll also be sharing some links at the end. So keep an eye on that chat because there will be some things that pop up in there. And um, well, gosh, last but least, um, I think that's about it. I wish I could be in front of you. I wish this was on a stage and I could see your faces. And so uh, really the best that I can do, I think is to just pretend that I'm walking on stage and you're all very, very excited to see me. Um, thank you, I, I appreciate that, uh, that applause. That applause was great. Uh, so really quickly, my name is John Moore. I'm the principal design partner at a product design agency called Innovate Map. If you haven't heard of us before, we are located right here in the heart of Indianapolis in the Midwest of the United States. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with um, Indianapolis, you may be a little bit more familiar with uh, some of these cities, New York, Chicago. So we're about a three hour drive from Chicago. So what does Innovate Map do? Well, Innovate Map is a digital product agency uh, and we help startups, scale ups and tech enabled businesses uh, grow their companies um, through expertise in product design, product management, product marketing, brand, and research. What really kind of sets us apart is we are not a uh, development shop. We don't actually write any code, uh, but we will work with our clients who either have their own dev teams or will help them find uh, really wonderful developers to get their products built out. Ultimately, our goal at Innovate Map is to make sure that our clients are building the right thing and they're building it for the right people. So a little bit about me, um, I'm super into denim. Um, I didn't realize that when we were taking the photos this, um, on this day that uh, we'd be able to see uh, jeans and uh, our shirt at the same time, but uh, here we are. Um, so quickly about me, so my background. I studied computer science and machine learning. That's actually where my background is um, in school. And my first job, um, I started as a UX designer. I joined on a, a UX design team in-house at a uh, marketing software company here in Indy called Teradata and uh, worked on that team and helped them build new features uh, as you do on a product team. Uh, and eventually after about three years, I left and uh, helped start an agency called Innovate Map and that's where I am today. Um, and today I am the principal design lead and I, I lead uh, a UX team and then also help lead kind of the larger design squad that we have of product marketing designers and brand designers as well. Um, in my tenure at Innovate Map, which is uh, coming up on about five, five and a half years, um, I've had the pleasure of working with over 150 clients. Um, it's a really amazing job because we get to work with people across all different industries and it gives us a unique perspective on how people can be um, as efficient as possible uh, when they're building out their products and they're building out their teams and they're trying to serve their end customer. So let's go ahead and dive into the workshop. Um, just a quick little overview of the curriculum we're going to talk about today in session one. Uh, that would be numbers one through four. So I'm going to start with just a little bit of a history lesson and a little bit of a background as to what design systems are, uh, where they sort of came from, and ultimately what the goal uh, behind design systems was um, and why those came to be. Secondly, I want to talk about a couple different reasons why you might want to build one. Um, and I'll split those into um, a couple different buckets. Number three, we'll talk about the phases of maturity of a design system. I think one of the biggest misnomers of uh, design systems is that it's kind of all or nothing. And I am in the camp and, and I'm a proponent of, uh, that's not necessarily the case. Um, there are different maturity levels of your design system and as your business grows, as your team grows and as your needs continue to evolve, um, then your design system will start looking different. And then lastly, we'll start looking at the actual system itself and we'll break it down into a bunch of categories of the different types of things that you might find in a design system. Um, if I were to give a theme to sort of session one, it is really just helping you understand why you might build a, a design system. Um, and the theme of session two is all about um, actually activating that thing and getting it built uh, with your team. But we're gonna stay pretty high level in this first session. We're not gonna go into the design details. Uh, we wanted this to be uh, relevant to any product person or any person on the leadership team who's maybe considering uh, building out a design system or investing more resources into uh, growing maybe an existing system that they have. So without further ado, let's have a bit of a history lesson and I'm gonna take you to the beautiful city of Venice, uh, but very specifically to about the year 1100 and to the, uh, the Venetian arsenal, which is what we're looking at here. 
this was actually the earliest record that I could sort of find of this idea of uh, systematic design. Um, and basically the way that, that it worked was in order to get these different ships built, uh, they would run them down these different canals and at each different stop or, or sort of port, um, they would actually add some, some new things to that particular ship. Should sound pretty familiar. Henry Ford did a, a similar thing with the Model T. We're all very familiar with that. And he's sort of known as the inventor of the, uh, the modern assembly line that we think of. Uh, but actually, what may be surprising, it's he didn't actually invent the assembly line. As we talked about, um, historically speaking, it's, it's sort of existed uh, throughout time. But there was a guy, his name was Ransom Olds, and he came up with this handsome looking uh, uh, motor vehicle here called the Oldsmobile Curved Dash Runabout. Um, I'd like to run that down the, uh, the freeway at about 15 miles per hour, but uh, he really was the pioneer of the stationary assembly line. Uh, the difference between his assembly line and Henry Ford's assembly line was uh, his was stationary, so the people would move. Uh, Henry Ford, on the other hand, the cars were put on conveyor belts and those would move down the line. So he really pioneered that assembly line and, and ultimately his goal was he wanted faster and more consistent output of the cars that were coming off the line. And in just one year after implementing his stationary uh, assembly line, he had actually quintupled the output of the factory from just 425 cars to over 2,500 cars. Uh, it doesn't seem like all that much and very significant by today's standards, but uh, you have to think about the time that was pretty remarkable. And even more so the fact that every car that came off at the end of the assembly line uh, that he had created was consistent it had gone through quality assurance and checking to make sure that it ran the way that it should. And uh, you know, those were up to the highest standards that they possibly could be. A couple other nice black and white photographs from, from that time. So then a modern look. Of course, things uh, evolved over time and the, uh, the assembly line moved along and then came software and, and as we are today, we recognize these as being design systems. So we have Apple's human interface guidelines, of course, the Salesforce Lightning design system, Carbon, all kinds of different design systems. We know these, we've read about them. Honestly, a lot of us have probably written about them before, and those are really wonderful. Um, these design systems have allowed these different companies to uh, really work efficiently and consistently across their entire business, not just inside of the products that they're building out. It's the reason why when you look at an Apple product today, it looks like Apple and it sounds like Apple and it just feels familiar. You can point at a product that maybe isn't even made or manufactured by Apple and say, hey, that looks like an Apple product. And the only way they've been able to achieve that is by this sort of central design system that goes across their entire organization, um, even outside of the, uh, the product discipline who maybe works on those digital uh, software tools. Okay, so then what actually is a design system? Well, there are a bunch of different definitions and of course there are all kinds of arguments as to what they are and what they aren't and things like that. So I kind of want to take it up a level and just be as generic as, as I could find possible with it still being useful. And I really think of a design system as a common set of tools and resources for team unity and efficiency. And I'm going to go through a, a list of words that I think um, really come to mind when I think of what a design system is. First and foremost, unity. This can start at the smallest team level, the design team itself, um, expand into the product organization. So unity between designers and product managers and product marketers, and they go across the entire organization into different departments like marketing and sales um, and even customer support. It's about harmony. Everyone is, is a, using and referring to the same central set of resources and tools and words and colors and type and things like that um, so that the entire experience from um, of their business that they're putting outwardly um, is very harmonious. It's all about collaboration. That's what we talked about, not just within, say, a product organization, but across the entire business itself. And that's just so um, across those different silos, you can cooperate and you know uh, the language that you need to be uh, speaking and the messages that you need to be conveying and the way things should look and the expectations that customers um, have when it comes to your product. It's about uniformity and familiarity. I wanted to put these together because when we think about digital product tools, um, the experience that an end consumer and a user ultimately has with your product, um, it needs to be uniform and it needs to be familiar. 
when you release new features, um, they, they will come to expect a certain level of experience and uh, they expect it to work a certain way. So the more familiar it can be, um, then the better. Efficiency. This I think is uh, absolutely critical when it comes to design systems. And, and ultimately I think it's one of the biggest benefits of having a system in the first place. Um, when you have this common set of tools that everyone across the organization can use, um, it really is gonna make you more efficient because people are not um, doing any rework. Um, they're able to find the answers that they need so that they can speak as one business instead of individuals um, spread across an entire business. Trust, this is both internally and externally. We think about trust inside of say a product organization or design team. I trust that maybe a junior designer um, is building off of you know, those central tools that are inside of that design system. But I also trust that when sales, um, sales associates are out in the field and they're talking to prospects and customers, uh, that they're actually going to convey the message of the product and really accurately convey the value of what it is um, that the product can do for the consumer. Second to last, confidence. Um, again, this is for designers, this is for PMs, this is for anyone. Uh, that central set of tools and resources is gonna give you confidence so that as you are uh, working both autonomously and collaboratively uh, with your colleagues at, across your business, um, you can feel confident that what you're doing is all striving toward that central goal and objective of your business. And lastly, it's about order. Uh, I wanted to put this one last because it's a bit of a contested one if you think about it. I know a lot of designers will say, well, we have a design system and sometimes it feels a little bit restrictive. Um, like I can't do anything with it outside of, you know, those Lego bricks that I have inside of the design system. Uh, but the fact of the matter is order can be very, very freeing. Um, the reason why I like designing with a design system is because it allows me to throw my effort towards things that I find much more important. I can be more innovative on behalf of my clients. I can spend more time making sure that I'm solving the right problem. And I can really invest time into the product to make sure that I'm building uh, the best experience possible. So topic number two, why might you build one? Well, I like to bucket these into two uh, different buckets, internal value and external value. We covered a lot of these already on that previous slide, but just in a little bit more detail, first and foremost, faster output and time to market. If you think about having that central set of tools and resources, uh, the ability to produce um, more quickly on behalf of the product team and even get things onto the website and into the hands of uh, people out in the field running sales, uh, the faster you can get things out there and into the market's hands, then the better for your business ultimately. Less time, money, and resources to build. This is absolutely huge. Uh, while there is a, an investment up front to sort of kickstart a design system and to maintain it over time, ultimately over time, you're gonna be saving yourself so much time. I have to clap that one because you will save so much time and money and resources um, in the long run if you build and you construct this system and if you get everyone on board um, working toward that, that central objective and using those tools and resources uh, that are being shared across the business. Ultimately, decision-making is easier. It's easier for the designer who's looking at maybe a new feature um, and, and deciding how it should work. It's easier on a, a product manager who's maybe collecting those requirements um, from research and things like that because they know the patterns that are available and the things that you've built already. And it's even easier on, on leadership to make decisions because as things are coming in from customers and they're considering new strategic things for their business, they're able to put it through a filter that oftentimes sits in the system itself, um, that business design system to help them understand, does this align to what our objectives are as a business or does it not? Cleaner designs and code. Um, I think this one just speaks for itself. When you have a central um, design system for designers and for developers to reference, ultimately what you're gonna get at the end is cleaner designs, more consistent code, and you're not gonna be reusing things over and over. Increased collaboration, this one is huge. Uh, like I said, it's not just collaboration within individual silos like design uh, or you know, marketing, but it's across the entire business. Um, having these tools in place will not only enable them to do that, but actually encourage them to go talk to someone who you might not talk to normally. Um, and if you need an answer to a question, refer to that central system, but also let others know um, when you have created resources that may be valuable to the rest of the organization as well. 
And then lastly, reduced redundancy. Uh, this is huge. This kind of goes with cleaner designs and code. If you've designed a button or a certain form or a certain click-through uh, wizard or a modal dialog, you don't want to have to redesign that every single time. Having those in one central saved location to reuse over and over uh, is going to save you a ton of time. This also goes, like I said, into the marketing teams, into the sales teams, into customer support, because if you have sort of that central um, set of tools for collaboration and resources, then they're all going to be looking at those, um, those things that exist already and hopefully um, using those to their, to their advantage to, uh, to save some time. So on the flip side then, external value. Um, design systems can be very self-serving uh, for your business. They certainly will make you faster, uh, but what you may not realize is in building them, you're actually providing a ton of value externally um, to prospects, to your customers, and those people who may want to use your tools someday. Why? Well, more frequent output. We talked about this on the internal value, uh, much faster time to market. Well, on the receiving end, I'm actually getting more features from you more often uh, because you're able to produce faster for me. And obviously that's good for me. The user experience that comes in the product itself is gonna be much, much more consistent. Um, this is huge for me because if I'm purchasing and using your digital product, um, I don't wanna have to invest in training and support to be able to understand how to use these new features. Um, if that experience is, is consistent inside of the product because you are building off of those central standards and best practices uh, defined in the design system, then your customers aren't gonna have any trouble um, onboarding into some of those new features that you may be putting out there. The product is easy to learn, very similar. Reduced customer support, this is huge. I kind of have a personal ongoing war against customer support. I think what customer support does is, is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, they really are the, the saviors of business because they're on that front line between uh, the customers and the business itself. Uh, so the more that I can do to create an easier to use product uh, for the end user, then the easier I will make their job because they're not answering the same questions over and over. Instead, they get to spend more time uh, providing a, you know, a, a higher human touch of customer support for things that aren't, uh, how do I reset my password or kind of those, those easier things you might think of. Elevated brand trust, this is huge. If you have consistently great features that have a consistent user experience and a consistent message and value uh, that's coming out of your company, then the customers on the end who are receiving uh, those new things uh, will just have an elevated uh, trust in your brand because they will know that the next time something comes out, the next time I get a marketing email in my inbox, um, that it's gonna be as good as I would expect and even better. And lastly, but probably most importantly, it's easier to sell. Um, if you are using that central system and everyone is abiding by uh, consistent messaging and touting the same values uh, to every single prospect that's out there, ultimately it's going to be easier to sell. And I think that's ultimately what we all want. Three, phases of maturity. So I talked about how uh, design systems, there's a bit of a misnomer that it's either all or nothing. And I, I promise you there is tons of literature, which we'll look at in a second, um, around what is a design system and what isn't a design system. I don't like to think of it that way because I really think that design systems have uh, pieces and it's just, it is a journey that you go on. So when you're in the startup phase of your design system, you're really part of a startup product team or you're beginning to create your first or brand new product in an existing business. So just because we're in the startup phase doesn't mean you're a startup company uh, with just a couple people. It could also mean that you're an enterprise company, but you're spinning up an entirely new feature or you're pursuing an entirely new market for your business. So the objective in this startup phase is purely efficiency. You want to enable your designers to produce more efficiently so that they can experiment, validate, and kickstart that MVP development. Some of the tools that you might consider in this phase of your design system are very simply a style guide and a component library. You just wanna be more efficient so that you can start building up your product in a consistent and efficient way so that you can ultimately experiment more, validate and really get that MVP into market and into the hands of your customers to start getting that feedback. It may look like something like this, 
Um, if you are a design team of one or two, if, I promise if you centralize your colors and your typography, that's gonna get you a long, long way. So next up is sort of the scaling phase. And just know that there's no real timeline to this. And it doesn't mean that the things that we talked about, uh, we'll talk about in the scaling phase, uh, you can't necessarily do when you're in that earlier phase either. But I did just wanna split these out so that you understand that each one kind of has a different objective. So in this scaling phase, you're really moving beyond those digital tools and beginning to build out communication tools so that you can get the message out as to what you're creating centrally. So your objective here, because of those communication tools, is consistency. You really wanna promote that cross-functional consistency by providing well-documented design rationale. So if you're a design team and you are starting to systematize some of your page patterns and some of your interactions and your components and things like that, starting to document those so that product management or people in sales can start to understand what those tools are, how they're to be used and how they work so that, you know, people will be speaking the same language and they'll understand on their own without intervention from the design team uh, exactly how things work or should work. Some of the tools at this phase that you'll be creating and considering are pattern libraries. Pattern libraries uh, can include everything from uh, page patterns themselves to uh, individual interaction workflows like a, a wizard, uh, things like that. Uh, a brand guide is even part of this as well. And of course, a, a voice and tone guide. I wanted to show these because it's not just about pieces of building out a product. That's not just what a design system serves. It can serve, like I said, all those different parts of an organization uh, from the product team to the marketing team to sales and beyond. That thing um, that you create in this scaling phase might start to look something like this. Um, now what we're looking at here is documentation around dropdown menus. So uh, we're starting to really communicate out so that we can get consistent usage uh, across the design team for when certain dropdowns may or may not be used. Um, the documentation that you see here can also be done in that startup phase as well, uh, but I will stress that if you're a smaller design team of maybe one or two or three people, it may not be all that important to have documentation and words of when and how to use these if you're a tight enough group that you can sort of manage that on your own. Uh, but over time, it's gonna become important to start putting rules around here um, and logic as to when you use these things and when you shouldn't. And this goes all the way down into the brand as well, um, into the different types of messages that you're putting out. So then the third and final but ever-growing phase is sort of this enterprise phase of maturity. In this phase, you're really scrutinizing all the processes within your business to just further optimize for autom automation, efficiency, and consistency. Ultimately, your objective here is optimization. You wanna operationalize and automate cross-functional processes, cooperation, and governance of the usage of that design system so that everyone is speaking that same language. Some of the tools that you'll see um, in this phase that you might start pursuing, design and dev tooling. This is everything from kind of central saved uh, design token, token libraries um, to different dev tooling tools like a shared you know, GitHub resource for the devs, and I'm sure I'm using that terminology incorrectly, um, but different tooling for those different squads to, to get their jobs done. Uh, design ops, there may start to spin up an entire team whose sole responsibility is maintaining almost from kind of a librarian standpoint, um, the actual growth and maintenance of the design system that you're creating. And then lastly, governance tools and processes around how you actually maintain, grow, and manage uh, the design system over time. So an example of kind of an enterprise mature design system is something like the Clarity design system here. Um, this is, I think, what a lot of people think of when they, when they write articles about what is a design system and uh, well, we absolutely need to build one and we need to have a website with documentation and we need to have code snippets and we need do this, but don't do that. That's all great. Um, it's all fine and well, but just know that depending on the size of your organization, the size of your team and kind of what your goals are and the challenges that you're trying to solve for, you may or may not need one of these. Um, some of these best in class design systems that we see from things like uh, IBM or Salesforce or Apple, these are teams of uh, sometimes hundreds or thousands of designers 
um, with equally as many and more people inside of the, the product function itself. And so they need tools like this to enable them to uh, fully collaborate and work as one sort of in harmony. Uh, but if you're a smaller team and you're, you're just trying to be a little bit more efficient as you build out your tools, you may not actually need uh, something as detailed as this. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you won't ever need it. Um, it's something to continuously strive for. And you really have to understand and internalize what are the goals of your system? Who are you trying to help? Um, and what kind of problems are you trying to solve with this design system? So lastly, let's actually look at the different parts of the system. And as we start breaking this down, um, just understand that these are not necessarily um, kind of steps either. You can do any of these in any sort of different order, again, based on what your needs are and what you're trying to uh, solve internally. So the system can be broken into a number of different buckets, each with, I would say, kind of uh, an increasingly more complex um, set of requirements and needs. Um, but I will say is that what most people think of when they think of a design system is chiefly um, design related. So they think about the visual language, the colors, the typography. They think about the UI elements, the buttons, the text fields and things like that. And then they think about the components themselves, things like date pickers or, um, you know, a component like cards and things like that. And there's certainly been plenty of literature written about why, well, that's not a design system. Your UI kit is not a design system. And if you just have this cute little, um, you know, sort of saved library of different um, buttons and textiles and colors and things like that, that's not a design system. Cute, nice try, um, but you know, you're not up here with the big dogs. I kind of don't feel that way. I think these are central parts of a design system, but they're certainly not, um, every part of the design system. But as you're going through your phases of maturity, um, these are things that you'll start to build out. So let's start with visual language. What are the things inside of sort of this bucket that you might consider uh, for building out your system? Just know that these are not comprehensive uh, at all. There are certainly other things that may fall into the visual language bucket of kind of your, your design system. Um, if you wanna know more, I know Nathan Curtis has written a lot of great um, resources around design systems and breaks it up in a very similar way. Uh, so if you're watching Nathan, I appreciate the, uh, the help because I definitely combed through uh, a lot of his different resources. So in the visual language, we have things like color, typography, iconography, motion can fit into the visual language as well. Although I'll say when you first start building out a design system, uh, you may not need to pursue motion uh, super urgently just because it does take a very specific skill set and I would put that kind of on a, a more advanced tier of uh, things you might want to consider putting into your system. Spacing, everything like margins and padding, photography, and then guidance around illustrations. That may look something like this, um, but what I will say is if you're a designer and you're sort of systematizing and centralizing the documentation of your visual language, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to create a beautiful looking sheet like this of your colors and your typography. If you're a team of one or two and those are built into your design tool, then that's perfectly fine. Um, if you really want to and you want to share this on Dribble and you want to share this on uh, Behance and those other places, by all means go for it. But just know that um, the examples I'm going to show you are just um, nice documentation people, has created, people have created, but it's not uh, necessary by any means. So next, I want to talk about UI elements. So if you think about atomic design, if you've not heard that before, atomic design is this, uh, this idea that if you think about a product and you break it down into its smallest elements, the atom, um, those are things like buttons or text fields, text areas, radio buttons, switches, labels, things like that. These are the smallest um, building blocks uh, that you'll use to build out your product, even build out your website. Um, and so on and so forth. So these atomic level elements, like I said, definitely not all inclusive, uh, but these will serve as the basis for your designs. And when you're in that startup phase of maturity of your design system, starting to get these built out and systematized and symbolized for easy reuse across your design team, uh, it's really gonna get you pretty far. Uh, I can't tell you how many times before I started using systems myself uh, that we built out at our agency how many times, every time I started a new project, I had to create buttons from scratch, 
or create checkbox, checkboxes from scratch or switches from scratch, um, I was pulling my hair out. I was doing the same thing over and over and over again. And it really was driving me crazy. And it was, it was taking a ton of my time and ultimately taking a ton of time uh, from our clients as well who are expecting us to deliver for them. So the faster you can systematize those for your own reuse, uh, then the better. What might that look like? Well, again, like I said, this is a very well-documented sheet um, of what we're looking at is buttons here. Um, so if you think about that scaling phase of maturity that we talked about before, um, this particular sheet is not only showing you what those atomic level elements of buttons might look like in their various states, but it's starting to give you some documentation and usage guidelines around when and how uh, this particular atom, uh, as it were, inside of the system should be used inside of your different pages of your product. Next, we get to UI components. So again, referring back to that kind of atomic design, if you've not heard of that before, UI components are sort of the molecules. If you think about um, atoms being uh, those buttons or maybe text fields, those really small, minute pieces of, uh, of UI, I, I kind of think of them as Lego bricks, then the molecules are really just combining a bunch of those to achieve a certain goal. So things uh, that might be molecules here or components, uh, breadcrumbs, things like calendars or, or date pickers, cards, dialogues, a file uploader, and then different visualizations might fall in here as well, although those are sometimes a little bit more advanced. An example here, we see a nice date picker, and you can see why it's a molecule, maybe not an atom or a, a UI element like we talked about before, because we have a combination of, we've got text fields, we've got titles, we've got buttons, and all kinds of different things. So this really falls into that molecular level of uh, UI components. And that's about as sciencey as I will get for this because, uh, <clears throat> Well, I'm a designer, not a scientist. Okay, we get to an uh, interaction pattern. So um, again, like I said, these are not necessarily sequential. And so if you're in that earlier phase of maturity, it may make sense to start systematizing um, and documenting some of these so that you and your design colleague can reuse these as well. Um, interaction patterns, these are things like creating objects in the system, deleting objects in the system, authentication, form structure, different click-through wizards, permissions, settings, things like this. We're looking at a modal here that's maybe this walkthrough wizard where I can kind of toggle through uh, these different steps here on the left side. And at each one of these steps, there are a certain number of things that I can do. These interaction patterns within uh, this sort of bucket of the system are super important. Um, and I will say that you'll probably save a majority of your time if you really reuse these interaction patterns um, aggressively. Um, every time you're creating a new component, if you're reusing that, that same workflow and that same pattern over and over again, you're gonna save yourself a ton of time. And again, that end consumer is gonna be familiar with the way things work in the system because you're just reusing things uh, over and over. Page templates, uh, things like list pages, object pages, search results, um, galleries, settings pages, they may look something like this. We may look, we're, we're sort of looking at a list page here. Uh, this was something we worked on for a client. And so this is something that we would systematize and sort of reuse. These data tables were, are very common in this particular product. And so we wanted to uh, really establish a, a feature rich pattern for what data tables should look like and how they should work. Um, and again, like I said, uh, be very enthusiastic to, to reuse these uh, time and time again throughout the product itself. We're getting close, hang in there. Uh, just a couple more and then uh, we'll sort of wrap up and get into some questions. Um, so documentation, uh, this is everything around editorial documentation. And this is maybe outside of the product itself. So what do our blog articles look like? What do they sound like? Um, how are we writing externally and sharing our thought leadership? Branding documentation, uh, research guidelines for when you're going out and you're pursuing different research participants and different types of users to answer questions for maybe new and upcoming features, uh, user personas, design practices, coding standards. You'll see in this box and some of these others that we're really starting to span across the organization itself. And it's not living just inside of kind of the design world that I think most people think of when you think of a design system. It really is much larger than that and you can help a lot more people uh, than just the designers on your, your product team. 
that may look something like this. Um, I pulled this from Dribble. Some uh, a designer did a really beautiful job uh, documenting uh, some of their personas, and so you can see the way that they've sort of named this person and and added some of the character characteristics and attributes of this particular person. You may or may not go to this level of detail um, from a design standpoint, creating out those personas uh, for your documentation, but if you do, certainly looks nice. And then lastly, we kind of end in this uh, catch-all bucket I'm calling other. This is everything from downloadable assets. So if you think about a place uh, for anyone in the organization to download logos, to download marketing screens that, um, of your product that they may want to put into a sales deck or things like that. Um, feedback and contribution. This is how can you gather feedback from customers? How can you gather feedback from prospects? And how can you gather feedback internally as you're going about uh, the development of your different product uh, features. Mission and pillars. This can be mission and pillars of the organization itself, or really just the mission and pillars of the design system at whatever phase of maturity uh, that you are. What are the goals and the, the objectives and the types of people uh, that you're trying to serve with this design system that you're creating? Onboarding new employees. Uh, this, I will say, is specific to those who are going to be helping out with the design system. So. Uh, what is the appropriate way to onboard new design team members and introduce them into uh, the design system and help them understand how to use those different components? How are you onboarding new people into your marketing team who are maybe working on marketing designs or maintaining the website? How are you onboarding salespeople so that they are speaking a common language and uh, you know, sharing the, the value that, that you want to share externally about your business and, and the goals that you can sort of achieve for them from a product standpoint. The design system team, uh, these are literally the members who are maintaining um, and building off this design system. Who are those people? And then lastly, utilities and tools. This goes down into uh, some of those different resources that you can actually use kind of from a tactical standpoint to maintain uh, that system. The one thing that I wanted to show from an example in this sort of other category um, that isn't design related is a workflow. So what we're looking at here is an adaptation of Brad Frost's design system governance process. Um, and I sort of adapted this for this presentation and put it inside of Whimsical, uh, which is a wonderful tool. Um, and what this is showing is how can we actually get new, um, new pieces into the system and what is sort of the process of getting those built out? Uh, when is it necessary to create one-off components versus adding something that may be uh, truly systematized? So with that, I know that was definitely a, uh, a fire hose of a lot of information. Like I said, I wanted to stay uh, kind of from a, a high level, give you an introduction as to what design systems are, and start breaking down all the different reasons why you might uh, consider building out one and then give you a peek into what actually makes up a design system and what are all the pieces inside of it. Um, so I definitely wanted to leave some time for our Q&A at the end, but I did just want to leave you with a couple final takeaways. First and foremost, uh, just rehashing that definition uh, that I said early on as to what a design system is. A design system is a common set of tools and resources for team unity and team efficiency. That's so, so, so important. Second, there are tons of different factors that can help you determine how sophisticated your system needs to be. I promise you, whatever you have in your head um, as to how your design system should look and how it should work, it probably doesn't need to be that complicated. Um, of course, there are one-off cases, but I guarantee uh, that you don't need to use a sledgehammer to crack a nut. What I'm saying here is if you're a design team of one, you do not need to create the Salesforce lighting design system. If you're a product team of three, you don't need to create the Clarity design system with detailed online documentation and a place uh, where you can share all that information across your organization. Would it be good if you had that? Absolutely, of course it would be great. Um, but you really have to prioritize where you wanna throw your effort, where you wanna throw your team resources, where you wanna throw money, um, and ultimately, just really pursue those objectives to solve the problems that you're really trying to solve with your design system. So don't, don't use a sledgehammer to crack a nut. That apparently is an idiom. I'd never heard of that before, but I, I liked it. So now we get into Q&A. Um, everyone take a deep breath. Um, that was a lot. Uh, the way that I want to do Q&A is if you could just use the chat, 
I think it's probably the easiest way that we don't have to worry about uh, people's cameras and audio and things like that. So if you have a question that you thought of maybe during the presentation, um, some, you know, it sparked an idea or a thought, go ahead and drop that into the chat and I'll kind of go through and pick a couple questions and, and answer them. And then provided my answer is good enough, I, I imagine you guys probably would be erupting into uh, applause, but I will of course leave that up to you. So I'm gonna start looking through the, uh, the chat to see what we have here. Um, so let's see, I'll just go with, uh, with the most recent one from uh, Jim Bartek. Thanks so much for your question. And his question was, what is an ideal platform to build a design system document inside of? Uh, well, you're gonna hate my answer, uh, but the question really is, it kind of depends. Um, it depends on the tools that your team is currently using. Um, it depends on what your needs are and kind of uh, like if permissions are important to you, I think that would definitely um, drive you towards certain tools and maybe away from other tools. Um, it really just depends on what your needs are. I will say, uh, very strongly to stay within tools that people are comfortable using already. Um, introducing new tools just for the sake of building out a design system because you think you might need one. Um, it's okay. And there will be times that you need to introduce new tools, uh, but allow them to remain comfortable in the tools uh, where they work every single day. Uh, if you're working inside a Dropbox paper or you're working inside a Notion, and that makes the most sense for documenting things and taking notes and things like that, stay there, uh, make it work for yourself. You don't have to create an entire wiki or an internal SharePoint where you can get all this documentation uh, written down. Uh, stay inside of those tools that make the most sense for you. And from a design, uh, design tool standpoint, there are a million out there. Sketch, Figma, Adobe XD, uh, it really doesn't matter. What I will say is spend the time and effort to get um, as masterful in those tools as possible uh, to make it as easy as possible to use those um, tools to your maximum advantage. All right, I'm going to scroll up a bit uh, to answer maybe a question that came uh, earlier. Let's see. If you're a startup designer and building a basic design system with a style guide and a component library, what is recommended in terms of ensuring uh, they're shared between designers and developers? Haha. <laughs> This is uh, really the, the million dollar question because just because you document it does not mean that people will use it. Um, I will say just a personal anecdote. Um, our agency uses a central design system sort of boilerplate that we've created um, and it has enabled us to work incredibly quickly uh, to build out these different products as efficiently and as consistently as possible. Um, but it does take time. Um, it takes time to get everyone comfortable with using uh, the tools that they have um, that are storing those different things like components and colors and uh, textiles and things like that. There, there will be a transition phase where um, they're learning those tools and how to apply them. So definitely don't expect that to happen overnight. Um, but as you are sort of starting to proliferate that across your product organization into the hands of designers and into the hands of developers, uh, the more public you can make it so that everyone can see it and everyone knows the tools that have been created. Um, and the more collaborative you are uh, during the build out of different product features and things like that, uh, then the more you will have sort of that accountability across your team uh, to use and ask questions and challenge whether or not do we need to create a new component for this or should we, we maybe reuse something uh, that exists already? Let's go for two more questions. Appreciate you adding those in. Here's a great question from uh, Nabil or Nabil. Um, don't all design systems have very similar documentation, which is non-company specific? Um, I think it's a pretty interesting insight. Uh, when it comes to kind of those lower level atomic or maybe uh, uh, molecular level components and things like that, buttons, drop downs, check boxes. I would say from a, from a UX standpoint, absolutely yes. I think there are definitely sh best practices that, that ought to be respected uh, when it comes to building out products. Uh, but as you get a little bit more sophisticated into things like page patterns and interaction flows and things like that, that's when the documentation really starts to vary from business to business, uh, just depending on the types of problems that they're solving. Um, one good example may be 
if you're at a larger organization, let's say you work in insurance and you are deleting a user's account, um, it is probably in your design system documentation that you want to have kind of a double confirmation if someone tries to delete a customer, uh, because that's a pretty heavy action and you, you want them to be very careful and know exactly what they're doing before they delete that person from the system. Um, so in their documentation, they would probably make it very explicit to say, if you're doing a delete of an object in the system, you need to confirm from the user that they actually want to delete that thing. At a different type of product company that maybe is in uh, less of a heavy industry or uh, the workflows are just a little bit lighter weight, um, you may not need such a detailed interaction for, uh, for system objects and things like that. It really varies. I, I love the question because I think it's a, it's a really great insight from the standpoint of, you know, if you go to school for user experience design or if you just use products every day, you kind of have this expectation for the way things should work and operate. And if they don't work and operate that way, you kind of know and you can tell. And that's when the experience isn't as good as it should be. Um, so to that end, I think the documentation and those rules and best practices are very similar. Uh, but of course, there are things that will differ uh, from business to business. All right, let's go with um, one final question um, from S. Calvert. Um, and the question was, how would you go about applying a new design system to a pre-existing product? Wow. Uh, so this is a phenomenal question. We hear this all the time um, from our different customers and our different clients. Um, ultimately, we're going to be ending on a doozy of a question because it's, it's a tricky question to answer. And it really depends on uh, what your goals are and what your objectives are. Um, with that design system and applying it to an existing product. Uh, of course, you can't just turn the lights off and let the product team go off and redesign the entire product. Uh, that's just simply not feasible. Um, and so instead, you'll have to work with the executive team, uh, work with the product team to sort of come up with a plan for um, incorporating those elements into the system, or I'm sorry, into the product itself from the system. Um, a bit of a, a vague answer, but let me give you a couple different techniques that we've done. Um, at our agency that have helped us and helped our clients sort of make that transition. Uh, first and foremost, if you start at sort of that lower level with your components and, and elements that we talked about, that kind of atomic and molecular level, um, if your, your style sheets within your product and within your website and things like that um, are, are built you know, in a, an easy to update way, then one of the things you can start with very simply is to just start getting some of those colors just start updating kind of one at a time some of those different elements um, to start really giving a, a facelift of the product itself. Um, what I will say though is one of the things to be really careful with, and we'll cover this in session two, when we talk about challenges, is you don't want to systematize and you don't want to just um, really put lipstick on a pig. I'm sure we've all heard that phrase before you don't wanna systematize bad practices. And so if you have an existing product and you're pursuing a new design system, it's a very good opportunity to start questioning maybe some of those existing features uh, that you have already and start questioning, is this the best way that we should be solving this problem? Um, or is there a better way? Are there patterns that we can start reusing or patterns uh, that we can start saving into the central system itself? Um, and that'll help you make determinations as to First and foremost, which features should you pursue um, first and which ones uh, don't maybe worry as much or, or matter as much. And then, um, yeah, it'll really just help you kind of focus your efforts into the right place to start rolling that system out. Because like I said, you can't do it overnight. And I definitely would encourage you not to do that. Um, I don't think your customers will like that. Um, but the last thing I'll say on that before we sort of end here uh, with some some final thoughts is that if you can identify, and we've done this with a number of our different clients, if you can identify kind of a safe set of customers who maybe have been early adopters of your product, uh, they've been around for a while and they're just fans of what you do, um, they're a good set of people to start testing some of these new um, system pieces with. And so if you go and you start updating maybe a single feature or maybe even a single page within your product, um, getting it all up to speed and up to date with the latest and greatest from your system um, is a great place to start. And if you can send that over to your, uh, your, your customers and start getting some validation on uh, the experience 
and making sure that they understand everything and it makes sense to them. Um, that'll also help you prioritize because if everything goes well, I think that can put you on the fast track to incorporating it into other features. And of course, if it doesn't go, uh, go well, then maybe you have to go back to the strategic drawing board to figure out uh, the best way to maybe roll this thing out into the product. So thank you so much for all your questions. Uh, we're not quite done. There are a couple other things that I wanna mention. Uh, first um, and foremost is this was session one. Uh, we will have a second session. You saw those other topics at the beginning of the, uh, the presentation that we're gonna cover. Um, so definitely sign up for session two. Um, Ellie will be dropping into the chat um, some links for this uh, session. So definitely register for that. We'd love to see you again. In that session, we're gonna talk about really activating your system. So in this session, we talked about the why. Why might I consider building one of these things out? And in session two, which is exactly one week from today at the exact same time, we'll be talking about prioritization. Everything from uh, those low level components to all the things we talked about around interaction patterns and things like that what I call the product approach. So this is how you can start actually building out that design system and, and identifying all the different components that, that you may need to centralize into a system. Uh, the challenges that you may encounter as you're building this thing out, because I will say it's not easy. It definitely takes an investment of, of, of time and energy, um, but we'll go through some of what those challenges might be. And then lastly, we'll end with some resources and tools uh, that you can consider using um, in all of your different teams who will be using this system inside of your organization. Uh, before you go, I have one last ask. Um, well, three specific asks. Um, I'd love for you to join the Better Product community. Uh, here at Innovate Map, we created a community of product professionals uh, where we share everything from resources uh, to videos to we have a wonderful podcast on uh, wherever you get your podcasts called Better Product. Um, so if you go to betterproduct.community, you can actually join that community and uh, really join other product professionals who are building uh, wonderful digital products. Uh, follow me on LinkedIn. I'd love to say hi. Uh, if you have further questions, feel free to reach out. I'll do my best to get to all of them. Um, and then lastly, if you want to learn more about Innovate Map, uh, you can click on the link uh, that Ellie has shared in the chat. We will be sharing all of these um, over email as well. And I have been recording all of this. And so if you want to revisit it again, or maybe you want to pull in your boss, or you want to pull in your friend um, for, you know, to, to sit down and make some popcorn and, and watch this all over again. That's awesome. Let me know, take a picture of it because I have to see that that actually happens. Uh, but thank you so much. I appreciate y'all coming out. Um, I'm going to leave these links up on screen so that you can uh, write them down so that you can visit the links in the chat. Uh, but otherwise, Thank you so much for coming out. Please stay safe, stay healthy, um, enjoy the rest of your week. And uh, it's been wonderful spending some time with you.